Okay? Bitte. Gut. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. And uh, let me welcome you all to this second session of our lecture se series. Um, we have our first guest speaker here today, and uh, we are very, very happy to have you here, Barbara Buchenau from Duisburg Essen. Let me introduce today's program to you. We will start out with a short summary of last week, just to get the main points together and remind ourselves of what we discussed uh, on an analytical level, on a historical level. Then we will have the main act, of course, lecture by um, Vice Rector Professor Barbara Buchenau. We will have time for discussion for this. And uh, for the discussion, Christian just reminded me that um, uh, last week, apparently, there was a bit of a problem with uh, uh, the, the chat tool that we have. Um, it has a German name, maybe that, that's why it doesn't really translate to other, uh, to other countries. Um, today we have uh, the YouTube chat function as well. So you should be able to uh, enter your questions in the chat tool there, and then Christian will be able to read them out. And uh, once we finish the discussion, we will reserve some time uh, for uh, technical and administrative questions. Uh, we received a couple of emails after last week's uh, session, and I think it's worthwhile taking some time to address these questions. Um, also, um, I will ask you to be a little bit patient with us, you know, that we have this, uh, this Aurora lecture series is one of the first ones. So there are a few problems and challenges to uh, address, and I think we'll, uh, it's uh, worthwhile taking time time for this uh, towards the end of the session. Let me start then with a quick summary of what we discussed last week we, um, with our perspectives on diversity. We agreed that uh, to study, to look at diversity, we really need to situate the phenomena geographically and historically. The geographical diversity I think we have in the semester program, and we went through this, the different speakers come from Aurora universities all across Europe, and we said that we sort of spread out from Reykjavik to, um, uh, to Naples, and um, um, and again, this, um, this situatedness of the, the different universities will play a huge part in how we discuss the diversity and how we do diversity. De Gruppenau pointed out the historical perspective of the history, say the history of equality. And you mentioned a few milestones, the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of the Rights of Men, um, and other movements that uh, played an important part in how we see diversity today. Um, you also analyzed three different narratives of diversity. I'm just going to quickly mention the, sort of the, the keyword, the equity case, the business case, and the excellent case. Um, how diversity is sort of um, has made into a capital in different businesses, or is it addressed as a as a philosophical, as a moral question? Of and um, I then proceeded to introduce an intersectional angle. Just a quick reminder. The main point is that differences do not simply add up. Discrimination does not simply add up, but different pathways of discrimination intersect and multiply. And I explained to you with the Crenshaw case um, how this actually works. What do we do when we address um, phenomena of diversity on an analytical level? We need to separate levels of institutions, individuals, the experiences of discrimination and diversity, representations and discourse, and then bring them back together. This is no small endeavor, um, but I think it is the way we need to address these phenomena. And then we ended up with the question of identity politics. And, I'm, but, uh, and we summarized that identity politics can be troubleshooting and troublemaking at the same time. And um, this also gives me the opportunity to sort of go back to the idea that this lecture series will present a variety of angles and perspectives. What it's not going to present is a solution. So we will have people from different institutions talking about matters of diversity and different ways of approaching diversity, of doing diversity. Yeah, so, but we will always come back to these questions of identity politics, what's the right way, how can we go about this? And today we have our first speaker here, Barbara Buchenau, who will tell us how she goes about this, how she deals with this in her research, but also in her function as the Vice uh, Rector of, amongst others, diversity. And Dirk will introduce Barbara Buchenau to us now. 
Yes, welcome also from my side. Um, thank you, Silke, and welcome, uh, Barbara from Duisburg Essen. It's a pleasure to have you here uh, in our uh, Brown Bag Lecture Series. Uh, uh, Barbara Buchenau is um, Professor of North American Studies, uh, Literary and Cultural Studies. So she's a literary um, scholar. Her fields are cultural theory, cultural history, multilingual early Americana, historical forms of popular culture, multiculturalism, and contemporary uh, literature. She works on uh, post-racial turn in uh, North American uh, writings, uh, diverse forms of literary and cultural transfers and exchanges um, informing literary production in North America and um, about the cultural and political work of stereotypical and typological representations of minority groups in text maps and visual arts. So you already can see that this is very close here uh, to our topic of uh, uh, diversity, but coming from the side of a literary uh, scholar. But uh, since uh, I think April 2018, uh, she is also, as Silke already mentioned, Vice Rector for Social Responsibility, Diversity and International Affairs of the University Duisburg-Essen, which is one of our partner universities in the uh, Aurora Network, uh, by the way, but I'm, I'm sure you will mention that um, the University of Duisburg-Essen is the first university in Germany to establish a Vice Rectorate concerned with diversity. Um, and um, and this position is now held by Barbara. So she is a literary scholar working on questions of diversity, um, uh, but also a practitioner, so to say, in the context of higher education when it comes to diversity and international affairs uh, and so on. She, is, she received her PhD from the University of Göttingen. Um, completed her habilitation, also there held visiting positions at universities like Stanford uh, in um, California. And it's really a pleasure uh, to have you here. Uh, and with this, I hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Dirk. And it's a pleasure for me to be here. And from my visit at Stanford, where I was just a visiting scholar, so someone sitting on on the fence trying to look in, I bring a picture of San Francisco that I took, San Francisco in rain, uh, that reminded me very much from the northern German climates uh, where I'm, I was born. So um, welcome to all in um, the, the online world. I'm, I'm very happy and uh, excited about this first uh, European lecture series that we're setting up. And as you can see with my title, I already am off um, off track because I think I've been asked to speak about diversity and well-being, um, and I remembered diversity and inclusion. Um, it's the beginning of our term in Germany, uh, the first week. We are very nervous about all those regulations with 3G and everybody on campus, um, and a lot of people still off campus. So bear with me, my PowerPoint is not, not pitch perfect. Um, mm -hmm. I've been running through two bomb scares, uh, so two uh, World War II bombs sitting in my hometown and in my university town, which have locked me up in my building. Uh, so the, the presentation is what it is, uh, and I've brought you some German language as well, and I hope you still have some joy uh, as I walk you through this. Um, looking at the date, uh, 10, 13, 2021, 20, I was trying to indicate that we're bridging languages, uh, even in terms of how you list the date, there's differences. We would, in Germany, we would say 13, 10, 21. Um, and here now with the, with the period looks odd. It doesn't look English either. Uh, so it's a plurilingual lecture series. And I think we have a plurilingual, pluricultural and plurihistorical approach to the question of what diversity is and how diversity can be done in academia, in universities, what it is about and uh, what we should look out for. And I'm trying to basically indicate a couple of red flags in the German academic landscape and in the US academic landscape. So uh, issues that are raising conflict on campus and issues that are working well. And I'm hoping that I can 
indicate some clear uh, directions. Um, so I would like to walk you uh, through five points in the following 45 minutes. I want to talk about the roots and the roots of academic debates about diversity. So where does it come from and where is it heading? Um, how do we move from basically, I think, a talk about diversity in the 1990s uh, to where we are now after and within among Black Lives Matter uh, at a time of racism, police violence, also violence on the streets um, and the question of academic um, and selection processes that are also not always uh, quite uh, without uh, color coding. Uh, so basically, I'm trying to indicate that we are, we've come from a very celebratory sense of diversity, diversity as a good, um, to a moment in time where we say that we need diversity for justice and that we need that diversity for innovation. So the business case is here and the justice cases here. And uh, at the beginning of the conversation about diversity, it was a moment of celebration. And I don't know whether in your hometown there's still a Benetton store, but I'm always saying that we're coming from the from a Benetton world of uh, diversity that is multi multicolor, multicultural, but not in terms of how we live, um, but rather in terms of how we celebrate it. And we've now moved into a far more uh, honest and serious and also conflictive debate about how to do diversity in academia and beyond academia. Um, to, in order to pin this down, I want to walk you through the 1990s in the US. Um, there at the mm -hmm. time we have a trend towards multiculturalism, but also a trend towards colorblindness. And in Germany in the 1990s, we have the invention of the category of Migrationshintergrund, migration background. Um, and it's currently there's the joke of has to all MH, do you do you have MH? So uh, do you have a disease? It's almost called like that. So people with um, with migration experience are um, becoming intensely critical of um, of this with and without migration background. Um, and this is our status today in the debate. Then I want to turn to key issues of innovation in conversations about diversity. They all cluster around the question of creativity, that for real creativity, we have to um, be able to live with different views of things with different different ways of doing things. And this is a definition of diversity. And then I will briefly walk you through our profile at our university. Uh, so we are a hyphenated university between two cities, but also a, a, a university with a lot of people uh, who live between countries, between languages, between different uh, family and religious affiliations. So we have, I think, a lot of experience in bridging worlds. So off we go into the roots and roots of diversity. Let me walk here. Let's start with the Universal Declaration of Cultural on Cultural Diversity, 2001. And remember, 2001 is also 2001 of 9-11. Uh, so it's a millennial moment. It's a sense of millennial uh, change. Millennial turns are always uh, full of anxiety, even without uh, big crises. But with 2001, I think with the crisis of 9-11, uh, um, the sense of this turn from one a millennial to millennium to the other uh, was very crucial. And the UNESCO before 9-11 uh, had this Universal Declaration of Cultural Diversity. Cultural diversity is the common heritage of humanity, so it's a basic root of our being in this world. It's a source of exchange, innovation, creativity. Many of these categories I think you've talked about when you were talking about excellence, about business, and about the way we are in this world, justice also. Cultural diversity is as necessary for humankind as biodiversity is for nature. This sounds particularly true in our moment today in 2021. So 20 years later, this um, equivalence between diversity and biodiversity is I think very prominent for us. Um, but this was here in 2001 already. 
Article two then says um, that from cultural diversity to cultural pluralism. Uh, so they're trying to move from an awareness of diversity to actually a way of doing things. Policies for the inclusion and participation of all citizens are guarantees for social cohesion, the vitality of civil society and peace. Cultural pluralism is indissociable from a dem democratic framework. So here the sense is that if we want to build a strong and good and just society, we need to have pluralism and allow for pluralism. And that this is an in ingredient for peace. And we'll come to back to this because in 2018, peace is no longer the core idea about diversity. So please mark this in 2001, the definition is diversity is, ne is a necessary ingredient to peace. Um, wait, I'm using the wrong error. Um, article three, cultural diversity is a factor of development. So this is the business case as well. Um, cultural diversity is one of the roots of development, understood not simply in terms of economic growth, but also as a means to achieve more satisfactory intellectual, emotional, moral, and spiritual existence. This is the basic definition upon which universities uh, and higher education base their claim of, on diversity, right? So that in order to be intellectually challenging, emotionally stable, morally good, spiritually enchanting, um, diversity is necessary. Um, and this is the principle on, upon which our universities probably all function. And now we move to the UNESCO World Day of Cultural Diversity for Dialogue and Development in 2018. So this is 17 years after 9-11, but also 17 years after a, a string of wars and conflicts um, that have developed from uh, the millennial turn. And now the question is, why does cultural diversity matter? Three quarters of the world's major conflicts have a cultural dimension. Bridging the gap between cultures is urgent and necessary for peace, stability, and development. So I've brought these uh, quotes from the UNESCO in order to indicate to you that over the past 20 years, there has been a quite extensive shift um, in our idea of diversity. So at the turn to our um, millennium, people were very certain that diversity is an ingredient of uh, peace and, and power um, and intellect. And here now we have um, diversity as almost a, a source also, or at, um, an ingredient of conflict. So the gap between cultures, even the idea that there is a culture that you can separate from another culture, it's a very different, um, and a divisive language that here comes in. And um, I think that's uh, quite striking in terms of how such a big um, association as UNESCO is shifting gear towards conflict. Cultural diversity, they say, is an asset that is indispensable for poverty reduction and the achievement of sustainable, sustainable development. So um, we move into diversity as an aspect of uh, managing uh, social conflict and diversity as an aspect of reducing poverty. It has an economic uh, dimension now and it has a dimension of social conflict. And they go on at the same time, acceptance and recognition of cultural diversity, in particular through innov innovative uh, use of media and information and communication technologies are conducive to dialogue among civilizations and cultures. Note again, the plural and the idea that there is one civilization and another, um, same with one culture and another, respect and mutual understanding. I'm emphasizing this so much because I'm not fully um, sure that UNESCO at this moment in 2018 is actually heading into or is basing its claim on a, an idea about cultural interaction that I would share. So as a literary and cultural scholar, I've learned that there is not a national culture, there is not a national civilization. 
there's not there is a very clear distinction between global south and global north between um the center of european imperialism american imperialism and its fringes um but this conversation about civilizations in the plural and cultures in the plural is actually feeding into this discourse of uh the west and the rest um of global north and global south uh, so we have a move in the public conversation on diversity that emphasizes the business case and that emphasizes um, the case of social peace. But in both emphases, there's, there's a marker that diversity itself is creating conflict. And um, this, I think, uh, is something that is not very uh, conducive to discourse in academia, and it's not very helpful to uh, the actual conflicts that are on the ground, because these conflicts are not cultural conflicts, but they're conflicts about access to uh, resources, access to support, access to um, having a right to speak. Um, this is not cultural diversity. Um, all right. Let us move to the US, uh, where in many ways diversity was invented. Um, and maybe it's not correct to say that in the US it was invented. My, my tendency is always to say the, that the Americas um, and other settler colonial um, territories very much uh, uh, depended on and drew on ideas of diversity, of managing diversity as well. So of allowing a lot of languages, allowing a lot of differences, but at the same time also making them work towards um, a social goal. Um, and within this history of managing diversity, there has always been a lot of injustice involved. And um, in the US, we have two versions of doing diversity. And I've brought you two advertisements of the 1990s. Um, this is an advertisement by a company that um, tries to define diversity as multicultural. A communi community is made up of dreams, ideas, and hard work. It's a blend of the ideals of men and women of diverse backgrounds, like woven threads in a colorful tapestry. Sometimes we also have this image of the salad bowl that uh, Canadian uh, discussions often use, or the mosaic. Here we have the tapestry, the colorful tapestry, people of diverse backgrounds, and they're woven uh, together into a tapestry. <clears throat> Not totally without violence, this language, um, but um, it emphasizes the idea of dreams and ideas. And it emphasizes a very US American discourse on hard work. The Protestant work ethic comes through here. So the idea that only if you work hard do you do you participate in this dream of diversity, uh, something that academia probably still asks you to do. And here's the other version. This is the colorblind version. Um, this is Ernest and Young, an advertisement, um, and it says in in the mm, small print, zebra zebras never wonder if they're white with black stripes or black with white stripes, they work together so they won't be lunch for a lion. This is language of the 1990s. Um, it's um, a pretty harsh uh, rhetoric and also a very clear logic of, of how to um, hold on to your job. Basically, if you don't worry about who you are and what you look like, but if you worry about the lion who's trying to eat you, then you're a good member of this company. Um, so this is what they call colorblind um, diversity, um, trying to avoid um, the, the, the enemies outside and trying to work together against someone who is uh, cast as an enemy. Oh, again, the wrong. And here's a comment by an African-American writer um, who is designing, uh, or who, who's writing from an African perspective. And she has a very bitter comment on how diversity is done in uh, US academia, but also in public institutions. Um, and she's making fun of, um, of how um, you can enter this debate um, of academia, but also of public institutions only if you mark yourself as, uh, as an outsider. 
uh, and if you mark uh, as that you mark yourself as as a uh, as, as someone who's very different from the rest and i'd like you to simply read it it's a very awful quote quote but it indicates how uh, access to um, the those uh, strong public institutions can only be had at this time, this is 2005, um, so you can only become a writer, you can have a voice only if you mark yourself as being different. Uh, so diversity as difference, as alterity, as um, um, moving along with an, with a cuisine and uh, ways of eating that are very different from uh, the Western um, cuisine. And this is, I think, the first indication of the conflicts that we see in, in the US uh, today, um, that diversity itself exacts a, a positioning by non-white speakers um, that uh, doesn't allow for real participation. So whereas in the US, we have this struggle between a multiculturalism of dreams and a colorblindness that looks for enemies and an effect in which you as a, a person of color have to mark yourself as folklore, basically. Um, in Germany, after the 1990s, we have a turn towards multi uh, interculturalism, so moving between cultures. Here we have this emphasis that one culture is different from another. So this, this uh, assumption that um, whatever context you're born into will determine how you are and who you are uh, for all of your life. Um, and connected with this sense of the essentialism of a culture, uh, the idea of the Migrationshintergrund, so the background in migration. So if you've come to a country from another country, you'll always be the person with migration uh, background. Uh, even if your grandparents have come to the country from another country. Um, and this, of course, doesn't apply to everybody. Um, my grandparents were born in Mexico uh, into in 1903 and five, I think. Uh, they moved to Germany. I've never been called uh, a person with migration background. So it has a strong uh, person of color. I, um, coloring to it, migration background, uh, distinguishes between the West and the rest. Okay. Here I want to first walk you through our um, numbers at our university in order to give you a sense of, of how this measures actually. So if you speak of diversity and if you speak of Migrationshintergrund, uh, of migration background, there are numbers to it. Um, and here in dark gray are the numbers of Germany. So 20% of students in Germany who've been asked. So we have no stat statistics that actually uh, capture the migration experience of students unless they provide their, um, their experiences in, um, in interviews. So this is, these data are also not very reliable. Um, part of the situation. Whereas, so in the US, you have the census, you always mark, click a box of uh, who you are and where you say you're coming from. In Germany, there's no such thing, and we have a hard time gathering data on ethnic diversity and on migra migration experience. So take these um, data with, with a large grain of salt, but 20% roughly of students have experience with migration. In Germany, currently, uh, the experience in the population is roughly 25%. So a quarter of all Germans um, have come to Germany from elsewhere or have parents or grandparents who've come uh, to Germany from elsewhere. And in academia, 20% of students uh, have this experience. So there is a threshold as you enter um, academia. Um, it's harder for people with uh, migration experience, with transnational families, to actually enter the university. And the, well, how do you call this color? This apricot color um, is uh, the University of Duisburg-Essen. So in um, 2018, um, when we asked the first semester students uh, where, uh, what their experience with migration is, 42% uh, of our students said um, they had transnational families and had experience with uh, border crossings. 
Uh, so um, in comparison to the national situation, more people access um, our university uh, than they do other uh, German universities. Um, this also applies to the question of citizenship. So 6% of all German students have have a citizenship that's other than German, and um, at uh, our university it's 14 percent, uh, so more international students. Um, then this is the number for those who uh, graduated in 2018. So students graduating in 2018 who participated in the interviews, 23% uh, of these students said uh, they had experience with migration. Um, in, in German universities, 4% uh, answered they had experience with migra migration. Gives you an indication of how hard it is to succeed in German academia if you have transnational uh, families. Um, and if you, especially if you're a person of, co of color. Then um, the, the other non-visible diversity, um, so hard to trace in terms of so not, not the last name, not the language, not um, the color of skin can convey this, uh, but it is a diversity that is immensely powerful, is the one of uh, first generation students. So whether your family has experience uh, with academic training and here uh, about 40% um, of all students in German university, um, wait, no, this is the other way around. So 55% so of all um, students in uh, German uh, university, finishing German universities uh, come from academic backgrounds. So every other student who finishes high, um, a university in Germany has an academic family. Um, and at UDE, um, so at my university, 60% of students uh, come from a, from a family that doesn't have an academic background. Um, so UDE is one of those Bildungsaufsteiger Universitäten, so those who, social, uh, academic climbers, um, students who come to uh, academia as the first person in the family. Um, and this is something that uh, the UDE has been uh, rather good at. So in a, a social dimension, a class dimension of diversity to do something about that. Um, okay, wait, this one is another. So thinking of these numbers, it's important to um, also consider what the German public debate about diversity is. And here I uh, ask you for forgiveness to, that I've brought you German language. Um, but I've brought you German language because Aurora is also about plurilingualism. And there's this wonderful Google Translator uh, and DeepL that uh, you can access to translate languages. And of course, I'll give you the, the English version of what it is here. Um, what I've brought you is a quote from the um, Central Office on Political Education. Um, the Central Office of, on Political Education trying to define racism in Germany. Um, and trying to define the importance of racism for social conflict uh, and for, for the loss of social uh, interaction in Germany. And they define um, or they here emphasize that the idea of the existence of human races um, has always, from the very beginning of the scientific debate about this, been um, de defined by a... a um, an emphasis or a drive to separate um, and to distinguish between people. So the research on race, um, they say here, uh, the scientific research on race uh, was from its beginning meant to um, create hegemony, uh, create differences and um, division. And, and I think that's uh, very important that a central office in Germany now has this very clear language also on the role of the sciences, the role of higher education in um, the, um, well, in the continued importance of racism. Um, and here they talk about how sci scientific research on, on skin color, on eye color, on, um, on your whole um, makeup has um, has been the f fundamental um, to persecution, 
to enslavement uh, and to murder. Uh, so they're clarifying very uh, strongly that academia has an immense obligation to actually come to terms with its history um, of um, defining differences uh, and, and being a promulgator of differences. Um, and then they clarify very strongly that there is no scientific, no biological um, uh, reasoning um, that actually makes racial differences um, in any way clear, clear. So the the idea of of race is an ideology and not a biological uh, thing. Um, and they say the concept of race uh, is the result of racism and not its um, what is Voraussetzung. So you you don't first have a um, have racism and then the concept of race, but you have a concept of race and then you get racism, right? Racism is what what is the outcome of uh, doing research um, in in this direction. So a very clear stance uh, on on racism and uh, Germany. Oh, something happened here. So this is about migration background, Migrationshintergrund. Um, and this is the statistical um, center, so the, the, the basically our census office um, that's, that tries to define a migration background. And the interesting thing is that the concept of migration background was defined by a scholar at the University of um, Essen at the time. So in the 1990s, uh, one of our uh, previous universities had a, had a set of scholars who worked on migration and they defined the idea of having a migration background. Um, and it's a very shady and very um, hard to grab category. A person has migration background, they say, when either the person it's uh, herself, himself, or one of the parents um, has, does not have um, German citizenship from birth onward. So you can acquire German citizenship when you're two years old and your kid itself will still have Migrationshintergrund. So it's very hard to grow out of migration background. Uh, this is, I think, what the definition says, that if you've moved into uh, Germany and acquired uh, migra um, German citizenship, then your, your, your offspring will still be considered uh, to be a German with uh, Migrationshintergrund. So something uh, that is still uh, very biological in, in its definition. Um, and the category with migration background was integrated in the, into the micro census in 2005. So as of that date, we start to have data. Uh, and before that, uh, it was very difficult to even have data on diversity, which is the uh, the other side of the coin that in order to do diversity, you need also need data, but data itself in the way it's defined is divisive. So there's a, um, it's a dilemma situation. The statistical category of migration background was used for non-German citizens, for people with multiple citizenships, for refugees, and for the offsprings of non-German citizens of people with multiple citizenships and refugees. You see, this is a category that is um, so slippery that it's immensely difficult to apply. Um, and I for my sense of um, what matters, I think the question of whether you have transnational family obligations, this does affect the, the many uh, borders you're able to navigate, um, the many different um, political and social settings that are you're able to navigate. And this is a, um, an addition of skills um, that you're acquiring. This is not what the definition is here. So this definition of migration background is very much concerned with citizenship and birth um, and how you're growing out of it. And that's why there's now this conversation, has du auch MH? Um, so as if uh, it's, uh, it's something uh, that is um, infectious, um, do you have migration background? Um, and here's a suggestion for further reading. If you want to read into the American situation, a long list of titles um, that you can 
uh, look at in uh, when you have time or if you're interested. Um, let me move now from here. So, so basically what I've tried to sketch is um, a, um, a, a Western conversation as marked in the UNESCO definition from diversity as a good, a, a strength in human interaction, a, a component for peace uh, towards an idea of uh, diversity as um, part uh, of conflict and solution. Um, so a sense that diversity itself also needs to be solved. Um, so this is the, glo the, the larger Western conversation. And in the US, uh, we move um, from, forward from an, a definition that is very much concerned with color. Um, and it's concerned with color and it's concerned uh, with dreams. In Germany, we move forward from a conversation that's very much concerned with cultural identity and the idea that cultures differ, so that there is a plural of cultures and that they differ, and that you're uh, attached to your family and that you can only slowly grow out of your family, basically. Um, I would like to now move into um, key issues of innovation um, when you do diversity. So why um, should universities, why should you um, think that diversity is something that you should uh, work with uh, and do, um, do something about? Um, and the current conversation is one in which diversity and creativity, so the ability to, to bring about change, um, are intricately linked. Um, and here's a uh, quote from, um, wait, I have to check. This is from Elsbach. Um, and she says, people are not born creative or uncreative, rather they, uh, oh no, sorry. This is, so this is research in, in the 1990s on uh, creativity and um, Sternberg and Lubart are saying, well, um, the way you um, become creative is by redefining problems in novel ways, take sensible ri risks, sell ideas that others might not initially accept, persevere in the face of obstacles, examine whether their own preconceptions are interfering with their creative process. This seems to be totally unconnected to diversity, right? Um, but these um, ways of being creative, they are the goals of academic education. So if you are successful in your academic education, you possibly can redefine a problem in a novel way and thus address it. And you can take risks um, and sensible risks, right? So not risks that uh, will um, not fi find solutions. And you can somehow establish a kind of community. You can sell your idea to others um, and make them accept it, and make them work with you. And you can persevere in the face of obstacles and examine um, the precon preconceptions that are hindering uh, with, the, with the creation, with the inno innovation. So the idea here is this is what, what academia wants you to learn apart from your field, apart from being a medical doctor, apart from be becoming a journalist, you want to be able to pitch an idea, hold on to the idea, convince others even if they're unconvinced. But the fact is that your ability to be uh, understood as someone who's so creative does depend on a person's reading of diversity, a person's reading of your ability to actually bring about this change. And here skin color comes in, linguistic ability comes in, social ability comes in. So are you able to um, follow the manners of the group? And will people uh, accept whether you're able to bring about change? And here Edsbach says recognition of new ideas Dep depends on typecasting of those he, who evaluate. Within only a couple of seconds, people who will be evaluating you or anybody's new idea, uh, they typecast into categories and they say, well, either you're a showrunner, if you're a showrunner, you're pretty much like everybody else, but able to do it and able to bring about change. Um, 
you might be read as an artist. If you're an artist, you look very different from everybody else. You seem very strange, but you'll be able to bring about the change because you are so different. Um, or you're cast as a neophyte, as someone who's newly arrived, newly planted into an environment and who can bring about change because you look at the world with new eyes. So three options basically available in a typecast world for you to bring about change. Um, and they are very narrow categories and very hard to somehow find your way in these three, three categories. Um, and the showrunner is actually the person who's uh, most likely to pretend something that he or she is not able to do. And now we come to the diversity part of it. Um, because Elsbach says real creativity isn't easily ca classified in those three categories of the neophyte, the artist, the showrunner. Um, so the research has found that people's implicit theories regarding the attributes of creative individuals as belonging to those three categories don't match it. They're off the mark. Um, instead, there's personal attributes that facilitate practical creative behavior. For example, cognitive flexibility, a penchant for diversity. So here it's just also a name, a penchant for diversity, an orientation toward problem sol solving that are signs of creativity. Let's look at the three categories that make up a creative person. So cognitive flexibility, a penchant for diversity means the acceptance that, that uh, you can work with people who are different from you or who seem to speak differently, who seem to think differently from you, um, and an orientation toward problem solving. If we think that um, before we looked at this version of diversity as being attached to color and dreams, or a version of diversity that's attached to uh, experiences with migration and experiences with a family that bridges uh, various national borders, then you start to possibly see how this is uh, very much attached to questions of cognitive flexibility. So if you have to bridge borders, whether national or borders that are established based on color, um, then, you, then you acquire this cognitive flexibility because you read your audiences and you're very much aware of how people think, how people put other people into boxes. Um, and how you need to make sure that you're not landing in one of these boxes um, and you're able to maneuver uh, around those, border, uh, those boundaries. And this is the cognitive uh, flexibility that then um, turns you into a creative per person. The same with the orientation towards uh, problem solving. So if you've been accustomed to live in one of those two systems that I introduced that are either color driven or driven by a narrative about crossing national borders, um, then you know how problems emerge and you also have found ways to solve these problems. And the, the high task is really to make other people see that you're able to uh, see those, um, those borders and have a way of crossing borders uh, that is better than anybody who's not even aware um, of the boundaries out there. Okay, I think I'm at my end almost, and I am uh, want to, Zika, how much, do I still have time? Yeah, okay. Then I want to walk you very briefly through what it means for the university. Um, so I've tried to give you a sense of, of two systems that have defined diversity very little in terms of sexuality, actually, in terms of uh, age or in terms of ability, but really in terms of culture and color um, more extensively uh, than actually age and uh, sexuality, gender, although these all feed into these categories. And if you, as a university um, board member or as a student of a university, look at things, then the question is, how can you make this be less relevant to your own future. So how can you enable your institution and yourself 
to not be caught by categories and not to be put into place. We always say that gender, for instance, is a is uh, assigned to where you're supposed to sit. Um, race is also very much assigned to as to where you're supposed to sit, whether you're supposed to speak. And how can an institution um, that prides itself in academic debate um, make sure that this is not um, the prominent uh, case uh, to assign quality and ideas? Um, so we've designed this vice rector uh, writ for social responsibility, diversity, and in international affairs. And here we try to look at national boundaries, but also ethnic boundaries, social boundaries, gender boundaries. Um, and we've what we're trying to um, unite are those people who work on diversity, people who work on inclusion. So the question of chronic illness, um, of disabilities, uh, special needs. Um, and the question of family needs, uh, fam family friendliness, but also if you care for um, elders, care for your neighbors, how can you make these aspects um, relevant to your own success in your student life and in your life as a researcher? Each one of them should make you a, a stronger researcher um, or a member of the university because you're able to be cognitive, uh, cognitively flexible because your, these challenges in your private life um, mean that you know how to cross border, uh, borders um, and not limit yourself by um, social circumstances. Um, and we try to look at this, so we call this dedicated to difference. We're trying to actually look at difference as, as a real uh, strength in a person. Uh, and we try to do this in this uh, Aurora network. And here you see our universities. And I hope that many of you come from one of these universities um, and that we're jointly actually dreaming also of crossing, making diversity um, give us some air under our wings to fly further. Um, and at the UDA, we also work uh, within our region uh, in a collaboration in order to strengthen diversity. Um, this is not so important. The important thing is thing is to really move forward in terms of th rethinking diversity, and this is what the UDA is trying uh, to do right now. Move away from criteria that are not germane to a topic. So um, yes, we need statistics on diversity, but you can't assess a person based on language um, or closeness to a region or family history. Um, you need to define criteria of, of a quality and excellence that are really germane to the topic. And that's the hardest part to do because people say they're counting, for instance, how many words you've written, how many publications you've published, but they actually look at um, you differently depending on whether you look like them or whether you look different from them. Uh, so making committees, making assessors able to see their own blind spots and their own predilections, their own ways of putting people into boxes is one of the hardest parts and one of the hardest nuts to crack. Uh, so to avoid criteria that are not germane to the topic, they, that seems so obvious, but it's not, um, as you probably know from your own um, story in academia. We want to develop a spirit that is immune to monocultures. So if you enter a room and everybody looks alike or everybody speaks alike, then probably there's something wrong. Um, we want to spirit, uh, develop a spirit that is also immune to self-selection uh, and to thinking in silos. So being challenged by someone in a room, um, being challenged by people who speak differently from you is something that diversity is all about. And we want to redefine care as accepting, welcoming, and respectful. In the German context, care is translated as kümmern. Um, and kümmern is something that people only do, so moms do it. Uh, it's, it has a gendered component. Uh, it's something you do if you have spare time. It's not something you do that you get paid for. Um, so um, the German definition of, of care is actually really deeply rooted in in our violent history, uh, in our post-fascist history, and to redefine care as something that is accepting, welcoming, respectful, and that actually defines the ability to for someone to be 
uh, giving care as something that is academically valuable uh, is interestingly a very hard nut to crack. And I think I've come to the end of my talk and hence I thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. I mean, you, you opened up a wide range of aspects and I think uh, I've, I've, I've written down a lot of comments. And uh, before, uh, while we start the discussion, I will perhaps ask you some questions myself and, uh, uh, and comment on some of the points. So you all have time to type your questions into the chat. Um, I, uh, just for technicalities, I received an email that the uh, YouTube chat is not opened yet, but uh, Christian said it was now, so I hope it, it works. If you can't enter, um, if it's not, if it's deactivated still, please write an email to uh, Christian Kons. Um, and I'll give you some time to, to gather your thoughts and, uh, and type them up and uh, type, uh, type questions into the chat. And uh, I would really ask you to do that because here you have, as you've seen, you have not only somebody who has uh, thought about this uh, question a lot and has done her research on it, but is now in a position where she has to implement it. I mean, how, how do you do it? How do you do diversity? And I think that is... Um, uh, that is one of the reasons we actually put together this lecture series because we want answers on that. So um, be aware that we might put you on the spot and ask you questions uh, for that. But in the meantime, let me just comment on the, on a few things you said. Um, um, maybe going back to the redefinition of care that you posted here, and I think this is very very important that you draw attention to this. Care is also deeply gendered, isn't it? I mean, the opposite of care is work. So <laughs> people, um, uh, so it's sort of divided in the, in, in, in the mind that women stay home and care for the children and care for elderly and care for the community, whereas husbands go leave the house, leave that private sphere and work. So we have uh, Erwerbsarbeit and care arbeit and I think it's very, um, very important to, you know, to, um, to see how these are differently connoted connotated historically um also um what i think is uh, is very important to draw attention to that you what you said uh, in, in the last slide that you have to make people aware of their own positionality where do you stand and um, um we always talk about this in class i'm a cultural anthropologist and so i was try to talk to uh, the students um, about the unmarked position. And of course, the unmarked position is difficult to spot because, you know, it's unmarked. But um, when you when you look around, and it's a shame that we're online now because we can't actually look around. But in a, imagine we're in a classroom now. And imagine um, when you look around, what you see, what you see, what, are, what, what do you think do all the people there have in common? And then you work your way through that um, we are all, you know, this and that and this and that. It's very interesting that color hardly comes into this. So color at the University of Innsbruck, it might be different and I hope it's different at other universities, is um, because we're such a deeply white institution due to our history and there's, I mean, there's plenty of reasons for this, but uh, you have to make people aware of the fact that the unmarked position is a white position, for example. Yeah. And then you have subjects where the unmarked position is a male position, etc., etc. But I mean, um, think about your own positionality. Where do you come from? What do you bring to the table? What assumptions, stereotypes, yeah, um, prejudices do you have? And how do you look at others in that way? And um, the uh, the one thing uh, I really want to comment on, in, and I want to comment on with an with an anecdote, is the um, sort of the the hierarchy of differences you mentioned. I mean, we are all um, devoted or dedicated to difference, dedicated to diversity, and uh, have festivals of diversity. And I remember that uh, my son, uh, who's uh, 11 years old now, but when he was in kindergarten, he said, oh, Mom, well, you know, we have sort of, I think they called it a festival of differences. And, and it was around Christmas. And so everybody could talk about what they do at Christmas. And James could tell us how Christmas in the US is. And Olivier told us how Christmas was in France. And um, he, I mean, I'm, I'm from Germany as well. He said a little bit about Germany. And, um, and interestingly enough, no Mohammed featured in this, no Fatma featured in this. I mean, this uh, the diversity, the appreciation of um, diversity 
is all good and well when it stays within certain limits. And it's it's this image you you, you made up, the West against the rest. So we, we celebrate uh, the, the European differences, but we have, have, have troubles coming to terms that we actually put them in a hierarchy. There is a strong hierarchy of differences. And... Um, and, and of course, I mean, you, you, you do have those strange indications where, so if you have the, the, the ethnic food day, food day basically in, in preschool, for instance, or in kindergarten, um, then very often um, people from um, Turkey are being asked to bring Turkish food and, um, and the families say, well, if, excuse me, I'm eating what you're eating. Uh, and I think this was the, the quote from... Um, from this African writer, right? That uh, you can only be diverse if you behave according to the expectations of what you're eating at home. So ethnic food is, is really also a very tricky ground in terms of allowing people um, to live in, in silos or to exit silos. Well, it, it is, it, it's exactly because uh, it's sort of the folklorization of difference, isn't it? I mean, um, being, uh, uh, eating different things, the eating exotic things. Um, I think it goes back to, and that's another point, I'm, I'm very grateful that you made this up, that um, the, um, uh, well, how, how to say this? Um, that the, um, first of all, I mean, the, the concept of culture is, of course, a tricky one in this because um, we culture is much more than the national culture, than the ethnic culture, uh, and uh, and we see this, and we have really have to conceptualize culture in this. So I'm I am German, yes, and I probably bring some things with me that you would attribute as typically German or German culture. But I am also, of course, many other things. I am, uh, I am a mother. I, you know, I love dogs. I, uh, I, might, I might be vegetarian. I might do certain sports. I mean, so it's uh, uh, the, the culture is, um, culture shapes groups. I think you, I'm sure you can say this, but you cannot um, reduce culture to an ethnic or to a national dimension. Of course, it's part of it. We can't negate it, but uh, but it should never. And uh, and maybe on, on this one, uh, to, going towards the question part, the questions part. Um, I think we we do this because uh, the, the the national difference or ethnic difference is easy to spot. It's easier to spot than say um, being a first and family student. So. Um, and the class dimension of diversity, uh, that's, that's also a point, uh, I think, and we're going to address this in the next week, where, where, it's, um, uh, where we're going to present a project from Innsbruck University about uh, sort of non-traditional students, but it's mostly about first and family students. Um, maybe, maybe you can say a little bit about this, how uh, uh, your university addresses the sort of the class dimension of diversity in students. Yeah, and uh, I'll be happy to do it because I think it also addresses this question of, of not thinking in silos. Um, we've done some really good um, investigations of, of what it is that uh, allows a student to succeed regardless of her family experience, um, also her linguistic ability, um, her previous experiences. So it, it's um, it's a an assessment that runs across uh, color lines and across uh, class lines that um, if you come to the uh, university and you're very um, anxious about exams mm -hmm. and if you have a low um, estimate of how well you can uh, craft your fate. So those two elements, right? Being afraid of exams and thinking that you cannot craft your fate. Um, those two elements will be strong indicators uh, of your difficulty to succeed. Um, and this is, this is not attached to uh, questions of, of skin color or questions of class, of academic experience. Um, so if you're afraid or if you think it, that you cannot really craft your fate, then uh, success is way harder to get by. Um, the tricky thing is that instructors expect students who are first generation students to not be very self-confident and they expect them to be not so confident in terms of shaping their fate. Uh, same goes for, for skin color um, and, and for religious differences. Uh, so there's the, the, the institution itself has certain expectations as to 
who uh, would come into this realm of being afraid of, of the exam and who would come into this realm of not a either having chosen the field wisely or of not um, overcoming uh, hurdles. At the same time, we know from our research that especially people from first generations or from um, transnational backgrounds are particularly savvy in maneuvering those difficulties. So um, the interesting thing is if you, as a, in, as a university, if you do something about, if you provide offers for people, people who are um, anxious of exams, um, and if you provide offers for people who need some uh, kind of um, guidance in terms of selecting the field, holding on to the field, um, maneuvering, as, as, uh, steering their fate, then the success rate goes up tremendously. Um, mm -hmm. So offering uh, assistance to first generation students, for instance, has been rather unsuccessful. Uh, because we've marked people at the entrance gate, hey, you're a first-generation student. Um, but uh, assessing where um, students see difficulties and where instructors do pre-categorization and then offering um, assistance in, in these two uh, fields in which um, the most conflicts arise in terms of the ability to succeed. That seems to be really relevant, also for researchers at the same mm -hmm. time. So I think the same holds true for the researchers who are trying to finish the dissertation, trying to finish their second book. Um, mm -hmm. So addressing anxiety. Yeah, that that that's very interesting, I and mean, it's also part of the dilemma you you pointed out at some point of, of visibility. I mean, uh, we want statistics, we need statistics, and in the U.S., it's you know the first thing you do, you fill in a a form and you you tick all sorts of boxes. But I mean, by by making by giving visibility, you also you know. Um, oh, yeah, shape those groups. Um, we have a question in in the chat, and um, I'm going to read it out to you. My question considers the geographical location of the University of Duisburg-Essen, NRW, uh, North Rhine-Westphalia, has the most residents in Germany compared to other states. Does your institution have an advantage to other states units doing diversity? Thank you. Perfect question. <laughs> this is like a steep ramp to climb up to. So it, it's uh, 17 million in North Rhine-Westphalia. We're the state with the largest population. We're also, I think, the state with the largest um, ethnic, social um, and religious diversity. Uh, so I think we have the privilege of having a lot of students who have a lot of experience and the same with the instructors. Uh, so I think both in terms of staff, in terms of uh, faculty and in terms of students, uh, diversity has been ingrained um, in the institution due to the history of uh, North Rhine-Westphalia. So strong industrial um, site with uh, a lot of uh, hard labor, uh, which means that a lot of students and faculty members have come from working class backgrounds uh, and have also experienced migration in their family history. Uh, so I think that's the um, so I think it, as, as a university in, in our location, it's impossible to not think in terms of um, diversity of experiences. Mm. There's a follow-up um, to this, especially Ruhrgebiet has an advantage, and in inverted commas, of diversity. A lot of Gastarbeiter worked in the factories and it's a very concentrated area. It's even hard to distinguish some cities from each other. Maybe there's also the aspect of urbanity, of urban space coming into this? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't think it's a... So um, some people say that we only um, carry out what we need to carry out, which is of course true. I mean, if you uh, look at your, your institution and think of what are the challenges, then you address the challenges. Um, but at the same time, I also think that we've come up with some really unique ways of, of um, not, um, so, so how could, can I put this? We have, for instance, a, a center of uh, Turkish uh, studies and we have an academy in exile and we have a Turkish literature department. So three units that look at people, uh, that look at the conflicts arising from questions of borders um, and connections between Turkey and Germany. And um, the, this deep web of interactions um, between Turkey and Germany. 
And this is, I think, could could not be done anywhere else. Um, and this is deeply ingrained, of course, to uh, in the history of uh, North Rhine Westphalia and our location. So, in minding yourself, uh, being mindful of your history and your location, I think, is what um, an institution needs to do, and it needs to move forward from there. Mm. Yeah, there's another follow-up uh, pointing out that uh, the concentration of people with transnational background uh, living in the Ruhrgebiet and that other parts of Germany and of course other parts of Europe don't have the same history and uh, and that's why it's so useful to bring all this together. I mean, this is, you, you speak from a very specific um, position within Europe, within Germany. Um, other, university, uh, other universities have different um, preconditions from where they have to basically start their diversity work, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, now I get the sense of, of where this could be going. So I think um, <laughs> sometimes we say we're the Bavaria of the future. So what if the car industry goes down? Um, mm -hmm. Then uh, then I think of both uh, the Volkswagen towns and the um, BMW towns um, have a very different uh, scenario that, so in, in a way we're, we're at the, um, we have quite some experience in terms of uh, re-industrialization and uh, bringing in a knowledge industry when other industries are not mm -hmm. as successful anymore. So looking at the ecological transformation and the social transformation, um, I don't think it's, a cur so, so some universities simply say, well, we can't do what you're doing because we're in a different town that is more academic. Um, but at the same time, I think well, these towns will change. Uh, so this is not this is not the future, right? The future is that people have a migration history. Uh, the future future is that we are looking for new industries. That economies are going down and others have to be pulled up. Um, so I think the fact that um, in Central Europe and especially in the German language speaking countries. Um, academia is accessible, well, more to people from academia and for white people is not something that will last, that should last, uh, because this is highly divisive. Um, so I think in, in many ways, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. it could be said that now we're uh, privileged because we have the environment, um, but in many ways I also think that other um, environments will change. Um, and uh, the need for academic training and um, for participation of academia in this transformation, the ecological transformation, is something that we'll all be facing. Mm -hmm. We have another, another question. What type of relation exists between diversity and language? Well, if you're able to translate all the time, or if you have to translate all the time, then you have this flexibility, this cognitive flexibility that was mentioned as a crucial uh, tool in creativity. So I think um, knowing many languages will make it hard for you at the entrance gate because people have a hard time to place you. Uh, so the, the, if you speak many languages, then people will always try to <laughs> put you in, have a hard time knowing where to put you. But at the same time, this ability to switch between languages has, of course, the component of cognitive flexibility. And this is the crucial part you need in order to address problems that are hard to solve. I think it also allows for sort of the, the the competence of shifting perspective. I mean, when you when you know when you speak two, three languages and, uh, and really uh, speak them and think of it, think in these languages that you that you know how they shape shape um, phenomena differently. Yeah, how grammar is constructed differently, and then that's sort of a, a way of uh, thinking. And I mean, it's quite obvious the more sort of ways of thinking you have to choose from, um, it can only boost your creativity and uh, sort of the innovative potential. Yeah, and but I think I, I should also say that. Um, it will always mean that you will ha have a harder time being recognized. Mm -hmm. So if you are a border crosser, if you're able to switch between different contexts, it also me means that you will run into more difficulties than what uh, Zeke, you've called the unmarked position. Um, so um, people in unmarked positions, um, whether white, whether female, male, uh, whether straight, um, 
able-bodiedness, um, um, also neurodiversity as an aspect. So if, if you're unmarked, if people think you're, you belong, people won't give you such a hard time. Mm -hmm. um, if you're able to switch between codes, between languages, between different cultural contexts, people will give you a harder time. Um, but that hopefully, um, with, with the kind of care that I'm trying to define, um, it allows you to become a strong person to fight in these uh, scenarios in which people want to place you or doesn't, don't want to let you in. Mm. That, that, that's very true and it's, uh, it's important food for thought, I think. Let me just ask uh, Christian, do we have any other questions? Not at the moment, I think. Um, I need to apologize for, on Dirk's behalf, he has difficulty attending uh, the session. He will get back to you, Barbara, <laughs> later on, uh, but uh, apologies to everybody else, of course. And um, if we don't have any uh, further questions, um, um, I want to finish by uh, just taking taking you up on one last point, and I think that's um, uh, that, that is something that everybody uh, needs to take away. Um, Conflicts and culture. There is cultural conflict. That's that's something that's that's a phrase that is so easily said and it is so very rarely true. I think what we need to really keep in mind that the conflict really is about access to resources, access to symbolic capital, to cultural capital, and the right to speak, the right to have heard. So the cultural conflict, and then this goes back to you know a, a long, um, long history of, of thought. Um, I think we really need to make sure that this stops at some point, and really have to uh, point out that it is access to resources that creates the, the conflict, not the cultures. I do have um, one last question, and this is uh, this is the going back back and forth with the uh, writing questions in the chat. Um, language teaching and learning question mark. Um, not sure what the question uh, is, but maybe you can say a few yeah. words on this. No, basically, I think that the the promise has always been. I, I've done some research on on uh, language teaching, and I think uh, it used to be that way that you taught other languages so that people could become travelers, which is very much an indication of how this is a bourgeois question, right? So you learn languages so that you can travel because you are able to cross borders. Um, then it became the idea that language um, learning actually allows you to be a bridge builder, um, that you can um, be an ambassador of your own um, settings, but also that you can build bridges. Um, nowadays, I think we're, uh, we have a better sense that within each language, you have ways of being in the world. So languages allow you to see certain things and disallow you to see other things. So if you have more than one language, you have more ways of making connections between objects and signs. Um, so I think the, the ability to learn languages um, shouldn't be a promise for um, easy translation, um, but it indicates, or you learn, as you learn many languages, you know how much is lost in translation. And you also learn how to shift perspectives, uh, change your perspective, see things from the other side. And I think that's the, the immense power of uh, language learning. But it's always been used in order to drag people into systems, so uh, into demonial <laughs> systems as well. Yeah, absolutely. Two sides to every coin. There are no other questions at the moment, and I would suggest that we take the last five minutes to address those technicalities and administrative questions, and uh, therefore say goodbye to you, Barbara. Thank you so much for um, for giving us an insight in your in your work, in your research, and uh, also showing us these two perspectives of um, studying diversity and uh, also doing diversity. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, we hope to see you soon in an Aurora context and all the best uh, at Duisburg Essen. Have a safe day. Avoid the bombs. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Zilke. And thanks to everybody who was has been listening. And I know this is a hard challenge because you're in different study programs. So bear with us and think this is a, uh, a first journey into something something new. Thank you. Bye-bye. 
Right, okay, we have another five uh, minutes or so, and uh, I would ask you uh, to then now type in the chat or contact us in, in any way about any administrative difficulties uh, or technica technical difficulties you've had so far. I mean, um, I asked you at the beginning be for a little bit of patience, we will address this, but it's, it might be easy for us to ex have an exchange about this now. Christian, could I also ask you maybe to um, uh, answer some of the questions, if there are any? Uh, yes, of course. And um, I, can all, I can also ask a question on behalf of our students. Um, I received several emails asking about special guidelines or restrictions when it comes to the reflective and summarizing essays. Mm -hmm. That's that's a very good idea. Maybe we can just put together a few aspects of what we expect, uh, what uh, an an essay like this uh, could uh, could look like. Yeah, I will I will do that. I will put together a few points and then uh, put them um, on all that, and maybe also uh, talk talk about this briefly at the beginning of the next session because all that might be another challenge for for some people so we can share these expectations that might make things easier that's a very good idea thank you anything else the youtube chat was working wasn't it the YouTube chat was work, uh, was working, but it's not as accessible as uh, Fragets in general, because for the YouTube chat you have to be logged in ah. into YouTube. Yeah. Okay, so that's something we need to work on. Um, uh, maybe it's something we need also need to address. Can you have both chats? Can you have Fragets and uh, the YouTube? Yes, I'm, I'm monitoring both okay. chats all the time. And we've got another question now on Frag Jetzt, um, which refers to us opening the conference room to students. Um, I don't have a, a problem with this, but I think um, I'm not sure if, it, uh, if everybody can, uh, can access the room uh, in a similar way. I mean, obviously, people from Innsbruck University, this is our system, they can um, log in uh, on, and share the, the, the BBB uh, screen. Um, but I'm not sure how this works for uh, people from the uh, partner universities. I mean, would you know, uh, Christian? Um, technically, it should be possible to open the room for students. Although I'm not sure if this is university policy, because mm. there, there have been some security issues in the past. And um, I think we should discuss this with, with Professor Rubno. Yeah, I think also we need to discuss it with the Vice Rectorate for Teaching, because, um, uh, I mean, they would... Um have an idea how that people... I mean, people must have some sort of an identity, uh, uh, University Innsbruck identity to to log on, and then it would be um, and that would be linked to their email address, to their institutional email address from their home university, and um, and that might make it possible, but probably not for any Gmail addresses and uh, etc. So you'd need to bring in uh, a um, a university email address. Yeah, and um, there is another question now coming into the YouTube chat. Mm -hmm. Um, which is just asking um, if the students are allowed to choose the uh, lessons they write the essays on. And yes. And the simple question is yes. Yes. Um, you can choose the ones that you, you, you prefer. And another question, which is a more technical question, is how we, or the students, we um, are supposed to submit the essays. And I can say that um, if you reach the... Um, university's uh, online learning platform, which is called OLAT, O-L-A-T. It's also linked on the lecture series' website, and it is linked um, under the live stream in the information box of the live stream. 
Um, there you can upload the essays into a folder. And um, I asked the students there already, I put a little information text uh, inside of this folder, which is asking the students to submit their essays in a single file in either Word or PDF. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a lot of information is also on the, the website, which I, um, the address I'm, uh, I'm showing you right now. Um, how to access, if you have difficulties accessing this online learning platform, please let us know. But I mean, once you're on there, it's actually pretty easy because um, you can just upload your essay there. Um, I mean, if you have trouble, you can also send it to us via email, but I think it's easiest for us because, I mean, you need to submit several essays and it's easier for us to, uh, if we see, see it all on one, yeah. one page and then we can uh, see that you submitted your three or your five essays. Yeah, and, and as we discussed, um, if the students have problems uploading them onto OLAP, they can also send it to me. My email address is linked on the uh, lecture series' website and I will then upload the essays for them. But I would ask... Ich dich gleich zurück. Ich bin noch in der Videositzung, ja? But I would ask that, <laughs> that you still try to upload it onto OLAP first. Absolutely. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, no sorry, I got interrupted here uh, at the moment and I forgot to switch off my microphone. But um, uh, I think that's a very good idea, Christian. Thank you. Okay, so okay. I don't see any more questions now. Well, thank you very much for being with us today and I'll, I'll see you next week. Next week we're going to address another aspect of diversity, which is more about the social class and have people... Uh, no, I'm sorry, not, not next week, the week after that. Next week uh, we have a, a very special guest, uh, the, uh, min the Foreign Ministry of uh, Luxembourg, who will discuss uh, diversity with us from a sort of political point of view. Um, this is going to be a session in German. I'm going to say this uh, right away because uh, this is what they asked for. Um, but the week after that, we're going to switch back to English and we're going to switch back to the program. But of course, you are all invited to share, uh, to be with us next week as well. All right, I wish you a good week and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.